interesting note. Okay, here we are. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. And to those people in those empty chairs, it's your loss. Why am I here? Now, I, I'm looking across the room, and we've got, we've got brilliant doctors. We've got scientists. My tech people. There we go. <clears throat> I'm none of those people. Um, I'm prehistoric in that my work I do on something called television. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I think anecdotally, I'm going to walk you through a few things in my 15 minutes and tell you some stories that I hope in the end are going to really encourage you because. Why are we really here? We're talking about telemedicine. We're talking about the upside, and we're also talking about the fears we have about getting the engine started, and is it really going to work? So I open by saying I'm not a tech person, as everyone over here can tell you. I'm not a business. I sit on the board of the business school of Pepperdine, but I've never taken a business course. And I had them explain that to me when they invited me to come in. And they said, just shut up and do what you're told. <laughs> um, but I ha I, every single day, I comprise television shows based on innovation, disruption, and transformation in medicine. The show chronicles this and has chronicled it since 1988. In addition to that, I speak for the London Speaker Bureau. So what I hear on this side, I translate and talk about on the stage. So I'm immersed in what you guys do. Could I do it myself? Remains to be seen. But I can certainly convey the messaging for what it is you do. So I'm going to ask anybody here, if I ask you to give me the name of a Surgeon General, what's the first name that comes to mind? And don't trick me with this. Well, this guy. OK? All right. I'm going to spin the little story about this guy. You're right. Sierra Coop, you get the prize. Why do you remember him? <laughs> he, he, he was born, he grew a beard, and then he died. What? <laughs> yes. Exactly right. He was in a largely, until that point, ceremonial position. And he didn't really ha <clears throat> have any real authority. And he was curbed on a lot of things, as was, you know. And he also looked like Dalton Hesse. And, and he knew it. <laughs> now, that's why you remember him. I mean, and one of the things he did was he was the big tobacco fighter. Okay? We have these labels. These labels preceded him as Surgeon General, but he's the guy who really jumped on it and pounced on it. Now, why do I remember him? I was a madman on both Madison Avenue and Michigan Avenue. Uh, working for Leo Burnett, I was doing Snap, Crackle, and Pop. I was doing The Jolly Green Giant. And included in my portfolio of work was The Marlboro Man. Um, as a young guy, I was not in any way intimidated by selling cigarettes. 1973, I lost my father to lung cancer. Um, but I was very proud of the work that I did. The reason I remember Coop, and there I am with a crazy tie, is one day in the early 80s, as he got appointed Surgeon General and knew of my work on Marlboro, I was invited to go to Washington. And I thought, wow, I'll get all dressed up. There'll be a car with flags on the fenders, and they'll pick me up, and I'll go into some palatial building, and I'll have this really important meeting with security guards and, and all that stuff. No. I get to the airport. There's a little note waiting for me. Uh, Mike, get on the subway. Go to the Grosvenor stop. Get off at the platform. It was almost like they were teeing me up to kill me or something. I didn't know what this was. <clears throat> 
So I go out to this platform and I look down the hill, because it was an elevated platform, and there's this guy with a beard sitting there in a Jeep. And he motions over to me, says, come on. So I jump in the Jeep, we go to his house, I walk down this hallway of his home. There's his picture with Reagan, there's his picture with Nixon. You know, I, you know it's, it's a pretty impressive thing. We go back into the inner sanctum of where he is. He sits me down and he knew my whole story. There was ever evidently some kind of dossier on me or something, I don't know, from the Marlboro Man or something. <clears throat> and he said to me, Michael, things are about to change. And I went, okay. And I was ready for change. First thing he said to me was, you're not allowed to market cigarettes anymore. Cigarettes in 1970 were taken off of television completely. And from there, everything was a new warning label, something new spin. But he said, you can't market cigarettes, but now you can market health. And when I had this conversation with him, I was wearing blue jeans and I was doing Levi Strauss out of San Francisco. And overnight, I transformed my entire career from consumer advertising to consumer medical advertising. Now this is what I had been doing and not even thinking about. He said, I'm gonna tell you about home health. And this is really important, home health. Home health at that moment in time was growing 13% a year. Why? Very simple. Quality of life, reduced cost. Let's think about Uncle Ralph being titrated morphine. Would he rather himself be in an acute setting or would he rather be home? Secondly, in terms of cost, what does that acute setting cost cost versus being at home? So it kind of made sense to me. Yeah, this home health thing, but I was preconditioned to any health care I'd ever gotten was going to the doctor's office, going to the hospital. Some doctors were hanging on by their fingernails to doing house visits, but there was no real thing called home health. And everybody was afraid of it, and there was tons of pushback from doctors and everybody else. I started the first home health magazine with Surgeon General Coop and learned everything I could about home health. And it was true, as long as we concentrated on quality of life and reduced cost, this is really who we had to satisfy. Some years later in 2000, I had a, the largest independent ad agency in San Francisco, and one of my accounts was McKesson HBOC. They came to me and they said, Mike, we want you to introduce our e-pharma initiative. So I go, tell me what that is. Okay, it's great. Now in every pharmacy by the cash register is gonna be a screen, touch screen, it's a wayfinder, and you can get answers to your health questions. And I went, whoa, have you run this by doctors? Doctors don't particularly like that. He said, yeah, the pharmacist is gonna be like the new guy to go to and blah, blah, blah. I'm kind of going, okay. So I go to the MGM Grand in Las Vegas to introduce this to pharmacies, and people are either really excited or completely freaking out and don't know what's gonna happen. Fast forward, I can walk into a CVS minute clinic tomorrow if I feel I have flu symptoms, ask the nurse on duty for a Z-Pak script, walk outside, get my medication, and go home. Is it right or is it wrong? I don't know, but it has been accepted and it's here. The, the, the message that I need to leave with you is this. Uh, <clears throat> classically, medical marketing is B2B. You have a company with a device or something and they send a detailed person to your office and you have that conversation. Well, it's changed to B to C to B forevermore. I see this on my television show. I have 117 million viewers on PBS who are 30% better educated and 30% more affluent than any other broadcast viewers. It's the most coveted audience in the world. They wanna be in the conversation. Now on the internet, what are the two big reasons people search the web? You may know this, you may not. Number one, porn. <laughs> Number two, health. 
People are actively involved with this concept. I, uh, not too long ago, I was working and I felt a pop on my left arm. And I looked up at the top of my shoulder and in a ball was my bicep. And I went, whoa, and it didn't hurt. But you think the first thing I would do is run and call my doctor, and I didn't. I went inside and I went to Google. And I typed in the search bar what just happened to me. And it said, oh yeah, you've just attached your distal long head bicep tendon. And now it's in your shoulder. And I went, oh. Then I said, well, wait a minute. Now I know what's happened. I'm going to go to YouTube. Let's see the procedures. <laughs> so there's 10 pages of procedures. And some of them are nasty. Some of them just mangle your arm and, and destroy you and everything. I thought, but then I come to this thing from Arthrex, which is called the bicep button. Tiny incision, they go in, they massage the bicep back down, put a little button on the end of it, drill a hole in the radius. Sounds a little grisly, but you're knocked out. Um, so then and only then do I call my friend Pete Hansen in San Diego, San Diego Charger at the time, lead orthopod, and I said, all right, first, am I right? about this, did I just attach this? He goes, yeah, I sent him a photo. I said, I said how about this, uh, this uh, bi button bicep? He goes, good procedure. You wanna make sure you get the right guy. And then he named the nerve that was in the area. He said, you don't wanna screw up that nerve. You need a guy who's done this. So I said, okay, all right. So, so far I'm doing okay. Would you recommend somebody to me who does that procedure? Best guy is Wayne Gretzky's personal orthopod. And he goes, and you want to be on the table in 48 to 72 hours because you don't want deep scar tissue to form. So I said, okay. I get on the horn, I'm calling around. I get this guy to come down to Los Alamitos Hospital. I get on the table and I have now full function of my arm, full supination, pronation. 10 months of rehab because you, don't, you only rehab something like that, as many of you know, 10% a month. <clears throat> Here's what's important about that little story. In my show, I am constantly talking with viewers of PBS who have nothing to do with medicine, who now insist on being part of the process. Telemedicine is all about quality of life, lower cost, and B to C to B. Include that consumer. I talk to consumers every day, and every quarter we add another five or 10 million viewers on our show. Telemedicine is home health on steroids. All of the same challenges, pushback, tentativeness that was there decades ago for home health when it was new. And to a smaller degree, the McKesson e Pharma initiative and bringing now nurses and pharmacists and people into this health discussion, clearly now is here. Now, real quickly, I want to play something for you. This is my little entree. Can we, can we do the video, Erica? And then I'll explain a little bit about this, and then I'm sure I'm going to be over time. But this is my association with telehealth. Fact or fiction? And ER visits for sore throats are absolutely necessary. Fiction. A recent study from Harvard University indicates three out of four of doctor and ER visits for sore throats are not necessary. Fact, 75% of sore throats are viral. Antibiotics are useless. Fact, this is a major source of health system waste. Fact, doctors waste time and resources treating non-threatening conditions. Fact. Insurance pays around $564 per ER visit, necessary or not. Fact, the consumer's premium rises. Fact, the financial impact will continue to skyrocket upward. Fewer emergency rooms, higher costs. We believe we have a simple way to fix this. QN, safe, effective, affordable health. Fact. A wooden stick in the throat hurts. The tongue curls around it, forcing a gag reflex. Fact. To see what is happening in the throat, you need to see it clearly. 
We give them a simple at-home system that could allow them to intelligently examine, compare, and report the first signs of a sore throat. Not the wooden stick method everyone hates. Instead, a unique doctor-designed patented device which is part of a simple yet ingenious new system. No gagging, no obstruction, a far better, more comfortable and enlightening home examination of the throat. The Say Ah device, patented and smart, but that's only the beginning. Inspect, compare and report instantly to our doctor designed guide and smart app. Better information, smarter action plan. Priced so everyone can afford because everyone gets sore throats. And the perfect premium giveaway. It works. It's simple and easy to use. And it's market ready. Say ah. And say ah pro. Thank, Thank you, you for, for indulging, indulging me in that, that little, little sales, sales pitch. pitch. Um, what I'm trying to do is show you that, because this is my company, this is my entree into telehealth, and tying that little plastic dollar stick together with an app so that mom who's panicking at 2 a.m. with a child with a sore throat can transfer images to an online MD, learn if there's a favor, fever, and see if there's strep, okay? But what's important to pull away is I'm practicing what I preach. At the core of this entire system is a panicky mom who that Harvard statistic is showing is running to emergency rooms. 12 million visits a year, of which easily three quarters are a waste. The kid gets annoyed. He doesn't want to be schlepped over to, a, to an ER. And then they're going to look at him. And if it's viral, they're going to send him home. A lot of this can be properly enabled through telemedicine. And this is really what the trappings of my initial conversations were with Milton, who's a brilliant guy. I'm a class one med device. I'm a toothbrush. I have very few hurdles I got to jump over. But ultimately, this is going to be about, and I've talked to major thermometry companies and whatever, this problem needs a three-legged stool. It needs my stick. It needs a non-invasive child thermometer because the doctor is going to want to know if there's a fever. And it needs a telemedicine partner. How many people get sore throats? Everybody, a couple a year. So this is how I view telemedicine with an eye toward doing it all for the patient. It is potentially huge, but we need to keep the cost down. And, you know, this, this would be my overall message in terms of, uh, of always including the customer in the B to C to B. Um, I just may have hit my 15 minutes, so. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, all questions are open if anybody yeah, has. Thank you so much. In all your years of interviewing so many people, what story or experience stands out most? Just There's a recent one. I had a, uh, I had a seven board certified sleep medicine, asthma, allergy, everything. Who knows when this guy has time to practice with seven board certifications? Out of New York, and he'd invented something called, he called the free breather, stem cell nebulizer. He mixes up a stem cocktail, puts this muzzle on, which leaves you with a blood face. You breathe in the stem cocktail, and you're symptom free of asthma and allergy. What was unique and humorous about this guy was a little Indian doctor, maybe five feet tall, and I went to go pick him up at the airport, and he said, Mike, can I bring a patient? And I go, yeah, of course, of course, we can do that in a segment. In tote behind this little guy is Mr. Universe. I meet Mr. Universe, he breaks my hand and the handshake and whatever, and I go, what? What's up with you? What are you doing here? And he goes, well, 
But when I was a little boy, I had asthma and allergies very bad. And when I reported for my first day at school, the school said, you can't be in any school sports. So I cried. And I went home and I told my dad, and my dad said, oh yeah? Went out and bought me a set of barbells. And I started to use the barbells ever since I was eight years old. And now, he goes in for this nebulized treatment and we demoed him getting the treatment and he walks out and here's this guy who for all other vital symptoms and signs is the Incredible Hulk, but he got knocked down by asthma and by allergies and he comes in and he breathes in this cocktail and this works for him. It gives him eight to 12 months of symptoms free and then he comes back and he does it again. So that would be, I think, one of them. But I've interviewed the guy who discovered HIV. I, I've interviewed Craig Jordan, who developed tamoxifen. I've in, interviewed uh, Nobel people. I've also interviewed some crazy people, like uh, Dr. 90210 from Beverly Hills. Uh, did Kevin Sorbo. We did um, uh, Pat Boone. Everybody has something to contribute. And when I do a segment, all I need is a patient benefit, a passionate MD, who will, is willing to deliver a non-scripted, teachable moment. Remember the words teachable moment? Where did that go? There's no time for teachable moments. Used to be back in the day, teachable moment was you'd sit down with a patient for 15, 20 minutes and talk about them and only them. There's no chance. Fortunately, maybe telehealth will enable some of that and will enable the return to an actual teachable moment, even though the MD you have is not really your your family MD, hopefully all of that will, will kind of get by. So, anybody else? Yeah. Hi. Good morning. So, um, since you have interviewed so many people, what would be one advice that you could give all of us from a standpoint of personal branding? Uh, you've, you've interviewed tons of people, so what is that sort of metric of Personal wow. branding. Well, my schooling in advertising is tied to something Leo Burnett actually trained me personally on, which is called inherent drama. Here's how inherent drama goes. And think of yourself in terms of inherent drama. This would be the messaging. Kellogg's comes to Leo Burnett with a bowl of crummy, sugar-coated flakes that rot kids' teeth. This stuff has no reason for being on the planet. Burnett sits there and is going, oh my God, what are we going to do with this? He's searching, he's searching, takes a pitcher of milk and pours it on top and there's a sound. And he looks at it and the sound continues. It's a crackling. He goes, aha. Uh -huh. Inside are three little elves. Their names are Snap, Crackle, and Pop. They live in there. And Kellogg's going, ew, okay. Um, uh, out comes the packaging, we start to tell the snap, crackle, and pop animated story. And what happens? Little Jimmy is with mom in the grocery and is going down the cereal aisle and it's like tug on the skirt, eh, get that. And she buys it. Now, amping it up from children, LeSueur Foods came to Burnett and said, we want to be the biggest vegetable, frozen vegetable company in the world. And the first question is, well, yeah, but your vegetables are identical to everybody else's vegetables. It's all the same. So Burnett calls him back and he says, all right, here's what we're going to do. You're losing your name, okay, means nothing. We're going to give you a new name and your vegetables come from a lush green valley, a valley that's guarded by a giant in a green loincloth who goes, ho, ho, ho. And the family's going, you really think this will work? Yeah. Within a couple of years, the biggest brand. But if there's any psychologist or psychiatry people in here, this is why it happened. Think about that giant. It says without saying, bigger green bean. It says guarded valley, special protected stock. The ho 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 part is every little kid who doesn't like vegetables likes the giant. All this stuff worked. And people, if given a choice, will make decisions 
based on these little fine things, which is why the consumer is critical and key and why I believe the consumer is critical key to health, to telehealth, because we are making these decisions. With this little stick I just showed you, I don't expect mom to make medical decisions. I don't want mom, and neither does mom, to look in the throat and try to identify strep. What I want mom to do is very simple. Comfort the child. Don't stick a wooden stick in the throat or your finger and make the kid gag. Look in the throat, light up the nasal pharynx, take your smartphone with light and camera, hold your stick, take a shot, telemed to your physician, let that physician look at it. And if there is something that indicates strep and you need a culture, you're gonna hear, come on in, take care of it. But if it's go back to sleep and have some chicken soup or something, which is the vast majority of these things, look at the service that telehealth has just performed. Look how mom has been involved, and mom wants to comfort, but she does not want to make medical decisions. So she's the perfect interface, but she's the one who's gonna push the button to make the whole system go. And as is the case with, for example, Teladoc, Teladoc right now has over 17 million subscribers who pay a monthly fee for the ability to touch a phone and have a strange doctor come on and take it to the next level. And it's working. So with what you ask about how you portray yourself, my doctor is not the most expensive doctor. He's not the greatest credentialed doctor. He's a doctor who talks to me, who understands me. When I come walking in, he knows who I am. Of course, he's going broke. He just switched to concierge because he can't make the, the practice work. He's working 16, 17 hours a day just being a great doctor. But if you think about it, if I ask you what kind of doctor do you want, don't you want a great doctor? Don't you want somebody who really appreciates you as an individual and thinks about your core issues and remembers you? Of course, everybody wants that. So my advice to you as a, a physician, what type of physician? Cardiologist, whoa. Well, you picked a good field. I don't think you're gonna be suffering too much for money. But, but you know, are, are you interventional? Okay, okay. Because what I love about cardiology are in interventional cardiologists who go after PAD, who, who really kind of sit you down. Remember, every other country in the world is preventive, except the United States. We love treatment. You go other places in the world, they can't afford to get the problem. And they pour everything they have into prevention. And I see that around the world. I don't know if I shared with you that story that we did on 60 Minutes, Bum Run Grad Hospital. And, well, I won't because I'm, I'm jumping on somebody else's time. But I'll, I'll chat with you a little bit about it. There's so many different little interesting stories that, that have come to me vis-a-vis -vis the show. So thank you. Up, oh, no, throw it, go, do it. Yeah. More of a comment that I'd like to hear your response on. So I'm a provider, I'm, you know. I'm, my wife's an OB, I'm an anesthesiologist, and if you look at it from a, from a provider perspective, I mean, clearly telemedicine is really the wave of the future of connecting the provider with the patient. But you brought up a comment about the, the over-informed patient, like a PBS a watcher who is out there, who is filtering the internet with incredible volumes of information, of which about 10% is scientific evidence-based information. So one of the downsides of the information age and the internet, not necessarily telemedicine, is these patients show up to you, whether it's on a telemedicine interaction or whether it's face-to-face, -face, with a huge volume of information. And as a provider, it's great, but in this day and age, as you point out, to have a successful practice as a primary care doctor, you don't have 40 minutes with a patient. You don't even have it on telemedicine. And you spend half of your time at that visit interacting with the patient, trying to filter through the information that they have to help them navigate what's real, what's not. And how do you see telemedicine actually helping that? 
Very good question. And by the way, let me ask you, if a patient's in your office and you are the doctor and they're the patient and they have come to you with a huge volume of useless information and you correct them on that instantly, do they fight you? Well, first of all, I wouldn't use the word correct because it's certainly not the right approach from a provider standpoint. Um, it's, you know, every patient is different. The more, the more informed and more intelligent your patient is, the harder it is sometimes to deal with it because they come empowered in a way where they think, although you've had 12 years of training and four years of residency and four years of fellowship because they went on the internet and spent the last two weeks reading every piece of volume of information there is that they know as much as you, but at the end of the day, they're not providers. And I think you spend a lot of time trying to not make it confrontational, but more educational, as you point out. But, you know, that's a characteristic that not every provider Let me has. Ask you in reverse. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest? Well, that's my question here. It's a, it's a very difficult situation that we've, technology has created. And again, I'm, I'm an anesthesiologist, so I don't deal with it much, but I have to lay in bed at night listening to my wife go on and on about these kind of stories. And, it's, and we live in an affluent community where most of the patients are like that. And it's, it's become difficult because the market forces push you to spend less time, yeah. yet yeah. the environment requires you to spend more time. Amazing question there. So we are running slightly time. There are some of the audience members have flights to catch, but Michael will be around here. Maybe that could be a segment we're going to explore for next year conference and make sure everyone come back to find out the answer next year. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much.